First, I know many Vermonters watched the President's remarks last night and have a lot of questions about the timeline he talked about. I want you all to know, I believe that in Vermont, not only can we meet his May 1st target, but we think we can exceed it. But I want to be very clear. This timeline that was given last night is for eligibility, not necessarily when people get their shots. While we appreciate the stake in the ground, what we really need is the doses to fulfill the timeline that we're laying out. As I said on Tuesday, we have an aggressive vaccine plan, but we've been waiting for confirmation from the federal government on what our Johnson & Johnson supply will be before we lay out a timeline in detail. Following President Biden's remarks, I'm assuming a clear supply picture will be made available to the states as soon as possible so we can confirm the schedule of our remaining age bands and share it with you next week. But again, I want Vermonters to know, if the federal government delivers the supply, we'll more than deliver on the President's eligibility goal. Next, uh, this Monday, I'll sign another one-month extension to the state of emergency. As a reminder, uh, this is how we put into place mitigation measures needed to keep people safe, but we also need it to methodically reopen. Next, as you know, we've moved up the opening date of Phase 5B of our vaccination rollout, which began yesterday. So. Everyone over the age of 16 with certain high-risk conditions can sign up. This is in addition to school employees and child care providers, as well as all those 65 and older. I want to remind the folks that just because we've moved into a new phase doesn't mean you can't sign up if you were previously eligible. So, if there's anyone over the age of 65 who hasn't scheduled their shot yet, please do so. The website and the number uh, to make your appointment is on the screen behind me. Next, as we previewed on Tuesday, I'm pleased to announce a few small changes in our guidance today. As you know, Vermonter, Vermont has taken one of, if not the most, cautious approaches in the country in order to slow the spread of the virus and reduce deaths and hospitalizations. I know this has caused a lot of frustration. I hear from people every day who think we should be moving faster to reopen like some other states have. But I want to remind Vermonters, there's a reason we have the lowest number of deaths in the country and the lowest death rate in the continental U.S. If our death rate was as high as some of our neighbors, like New York, we wouldn't be talking about 212 lives lost. We'd be talking about 1,500 or more. So I'll continue to take a methodical, strategic approach and turn the spigot a quarter turn at a time in close consultation and agreement with our health and epi experts. Fortunately, as we vaccinate more people, you can expect the spigot turns to be more frequent than they were last spring when we didn't have vaccines to help protect us. Because let's remember, vaccines will help us beat the virus with all, without all the mitigation measures we use over the last year. So today, we have two changes. First. As you remember, we put in place a multi-household gathering ban just before Thanksgiving. And recently, we lifted that for those who've been vaccinated and changed the guidance so a non-vaccinated household could gather with others who are vaccinated. <clears throat> Today, we're issuing guidance <clears throat> to allow two non-vaccinated households to gather at a time. You might recall last spring, <clears throat> We took a similar step with trusted households. But this is a bit different. Effective today, two non-vaccinated households may get together, but you're not limited to choose just one other household. You can do so with multiple households as long as it's just one at any given time. Of course, those who are vaccinated didn't count against the limit so you and one other non-vaccinated person 
could have several vaccinated friends or family members over for dinner. Another example, <clears throat> kids who obviously can't be vaccinated yet can have playdates again, which we know have been sorely missed and would be good for the mental health and emotional well-being of the kids as well as parents. We also change, uh, we'll also change our restaurant guidance, which currently restricts tables to just one household at a time. Effective today, restaurants will be able to seat six people at a table, and they can be from different families. Of course, capacity, distancing, and every other guideline remains in place. We're making this change because our health experts believe it's safe to do so, and because we know how hard it is for staff to determine who is and isn't from one household. This table limit is a way to ease the burden on them while allowing uh, people to get together again with some mitigation measures in place. Now, I know these changes are not as big as many other states have announced, including those in our region. But we feel they're positive and safe steps forward, and you can expect more spigot turns next week. As I've said, we'll be uh, taking incremental steps as more of our monitors are vaccinated. But I'm, I'm not going to flip the switch like Texas or other states. I don't believe it's the safest or fastest way out of this crisis, nor do I believe it's what most Vermonters want. And while masking and physical distancing will remain for months ahead, as I said last week, I believe we're going to be in very good shape uh, by uh, summer, midsummer. As you might remember, the governor's meeting with the White House didn't happen this week until after the media briefing. What the Biden administration told us was that we would only be receiving about 500 doses of Johnson Johnson this week and probably none the following week, but thought, um, but not confirmed, we'd get four to 5,000 doses by the end of the month. And again, as I said, next week, depending on the supply picture we receive from the feds, I should be able to announce a vaccine timeline for the rest of the age brands and then outline our larger exit strategy in detail by the first week of April. I appreciate everyone's patience, and I know all of us want to get back to normal, but as Dr. Levine and others have said, March is a critical month as we complete vaccinations for the most vulnerable. So we must continue to do all we can to help ourselves by wearing a mask, keeping our distance, washing our hands, and avoiding crowds when possible. But again, we're in the last laps of this very long and tough race. But I believe we can win it if we stick to our strategy and stay united. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce a special guest joining us today, Senator Sanders, who's been working hard for us in Washington uh, on the federal relief package. I've had uh, conversations with him as budget committee chairman as well as with Senator Leahy and Congressman Welch over the past several months on what Vermont needs are. So we're very pleased with much of what's in this package, and I want to thank the Senator for all he's done for our state. And I'll now turn it over to Senator Sanders for an update on what Vermonters can expect in the package. Welcome, Senator Sanders. Well, thank you very much, Governor Scott, and thank you very much for allowing me to join you this morning. Uh, and let me congratulate you for your leadership uh, in these very difficult times uh, for our state and thank the legislature as well for their great work. Uh, I think uh, everybody knows uh, that last week uh, the Congress passed what might well be the most consequential uh, piece of legislation to impact the lives of working people uh in many many decades uh and the theory behind this bill is that we had to take a hard look at the unprecedented set of crises facing our nation and that is as the governor indicated this terrible terrible pandemic claims hundreds of lives in vermont over half a million lives nationally made millions of people sick uh, we had to take a hard look at 
how the pandemic impacted the economy. Millions of people lost their jobs, small businesses went under, uh, had to take a hard look at the chaos and, and disruption uh, that our young people from literally childcare to graduate school experience uh, because of the disruption of their education. Uh, so it is a very, very comprehensive piece of legislation which more than any legislation that I have seen really does focus not on the needs of the wealthy and the powerful, but on the needs of ordinary people. Now, the bill is 628 pages, and I'm sure you don't want me to go through all of them, but let me just highlight uh, some of the uh, provisions in it which will impact Vermont. For a start, uh, Senator Leahy, Congressman Welch, and I worked very hard uh, to see that we could increase the amount of funding going directly into the state of Vermont in these difficult times. Uh, the bill that came to us from the House had about $800 million in it. Uh, Senator Leahy, who is chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and I am chairman of the Budget Committee, were able to get that number up to about $1.3 billion going into the state for the myriad needs that the state will have. Further, uh, we, I have believed for a very long time that in a moment when half of the people in our country are living paycheck to paycheck, probably the most important thing that we could do at this moment is just get cash into the hands of struggling families. I will never forget, as I'm sure the governor will not, uh, just the long lines of cars uh, that we have seen all over Vermont uh, in Burlington, all over the state, people lining up by the hundreds in order to get emergency uh, food packages. Uh, people are hurting and they need help. And probably the fastest way to alleviate uh, that financial burden is to get money directly into the hands of families. Uh, as you recall, a couple of months ago, we were able to get uh, direct payments of $600 uh, per working class adult, that is people 75,000 or under for individuals, 150,000 for couples. This bill increases that and adds another $1,400 per person. That includes the children as well. So if you are a family of four, that's $1,400 times four, $5,600. And by the way, dependents will also be included in that $1,400. Uh, the president is cognizant of the fact that it's imperative that we get that money out as quickly as possible. And I think people will see direct deposits coming into their accounts literally within the next few days. Uh, in addition to the direct payments, which I think will be very, very Sounded. helpful. And by the way, that means in our state, about 89% of the households, 428,000 adults and 145,000 kids. Uh, will be beneficiaries of these direct payments. Almost everybody will receive them. Uh, a lot of people in Vermont and around this country are still unemployed. Uh, what this legislation does is extend unemployment benefits uh, through early September. Uh, there will be a $300 supplement on top of what the state provides. And importantly, uh, there will be in this bill uh, a tax deduction for the first $10,000 in unemployment that people received in 2020. And that will be a big help to a lot of people who filed for unemployment in 2020. Uh, I don't have to tell anybody that the United States uh, has one of the highest rates of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. This bill in a very aggressive way addresses that crisis it increases the child tax credit from $2,000 to $3,000 or $3,600 for families with kids under the age of six. What studies have suggested is that this will, in fact, cut childhood poverty in the United States of America by up to 50 percent, an extraordinary achievement. Um, furthermore, uh, Many people in, in Vermont and throughout this country are struggling right now uh, in paying their rent. There's a rent eviction, which at some point is going to end. People need help 
in paying their back rent uh, and making sure that they can pay their mortgages. $152 million will be coming into the state of Vermont for rent and utility relief and $50 million for mortgage assistance. The goal here is to make sure that people don't lose their homes or that they are not evicted. Uh, again, we can't bring people back to work unless uh, they have a safe place to send their kids. And this bill will increase funding for child care by some $391 million uh, from early childhood through higher education. A lot of money coming in for education in the state of Vermont. Um, also, obviously, uh, the goal of the president and all of us is to crush this pandemic as quickly as we can. What we will be seeing, hopefully sooner than later, is an increase in production of the vaccines that we need. And most importantly, as the governor was talking about, getting those vaccines into the arms of the American people as quickly as we can. And when we talk about health care, one of the issues uh, I have worked on for a long time and deeply concerned about is primary health care, making sure that especially in this pandemic, uh, people can get to the doctor uh, when they need to get to the doctor. And I'm happy to say that in this bill, we have doubled funding for community health centers. About 25 percent of Vermonters get their primary health care, get their dental care, uh, get their mental health counseling, which is a huge issue. Uh, get their low-cost prescription drugs uh, from community health centers. As a result of this bill, there will be a significant, significant increase in funding uh, for community health centers in Vermont and around the country. Uh, one of the areas that I worry about is that as a result of the disruption of the education of our kids, our kids have lost a lot of uh, time uh, in school. Uh, and what we are putting into this bill is almost a tripling of funding for summer programs uh, and for after-school programs. So I would hope that uh, what we can do in Vermont, we look forward to working with the governor on that, is create exciting, interesting summer programs this summer uh, to make sure that kids can gain uh, some of the, um, the classes, regain some of what they had lost during the school year, and we're also going to be able to build very strong uh, after-school programs next year and the next several years uh, as well. Uh, in order to make sure that we get doctors uh, into underserved areas, we also tripled funding for the National Health Service Corps. That means making sure that we get doctors and nurses and dentists into areas uh, that we need them. So uh, bottom line is uh, this is an enormously comprehensive uh, piece of legislation. It will impact, uh, I suspect, almost every family uh, in the state of Vermont. Uh, and the goal here is to do everything that we can to help people who are struggling right now to rebuild our economy, to open up our businesses, to get our children back to school, and to crush this pandemic uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, I would also add uh, that uh, the work that we have to do here in Congress is certainly not done with the passage of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, much more has to be done. Uh, and in the coming weeks and months, I think you're going to see some efforts coming from the Budget Committee and elsewhere to create the millions of jobs that we need in this country, rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. No secret to anybody that in Vermont, uh, all over this country, roads, bridges, water systems, wastewater plants, are in desperate need of help. Help we can put people to work doing that. Uh, and we also have got to combat climate change, transform our energy system. And as a result of focusing on those issues, uh, we can create millions of good paying jobs. So uh, I think we are moving forward uh, in a very positive direction. Uh, my hope and expectation is that this legislation is gonna ease a lot of the anxiety that many families in Vermont are now experiencing. Uh, and uh, I look forward to working with you, Governor Scott, and the legislature uh, to keep going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Sanders, and uh, very welcome news for Vermont. And we really do appreciate all you've done uh, to protect us and help us through the recovery uh, in transitioning to some normalcy. 
and this should be just the booster shot we need, uh, the booster shot for the economy and for families uh, in Vermont to get us to transition again to some sort of normalcy. So thank you so much for all your efforts and all you do for Vermont. Thank you. Next, we'll be going uh, to Secretary French for the update on uh, education. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. I, I do want to thank Senator Sanders and our entire congressional delegation for their support of our schools. Uh, the strategies he outlined today, particularly uh, summer programming and after-school activities, will be key strategies uh, for our schools uh, in their recovery work and really help support our students, particularly those that live in uh, rural communities. Um, I want to begin my report with an update on our weekly PCR surveillance testing of school staff. Each week, we test about 25% of school staff, and the weekly sample includes schools from every geographic region of the state. Uh, we had not conducted the testing for a few weeks due to winter school vacations, uh, but the testing did resume this week. This week, we tested just under 3,000 school staff. Uh, to date, uh, one positive case was identified. So the positivity rate for school staff this week was 0.03%, and the positivity rate for the state as a whole remains low at 1.5%. With the implementation of our new vaccination program for school staff, it's likely we will make changes to the surveillance uh, testing program in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll have more information on that soon. In terms of the vaccination program for school staff, uh, Secretary Smith will provide some additional information, but I thought I'd make some comments on how it's going from the perspective of the Agency of Education. Uh, our agency manages uh, what I'd call the uh, customer service aspects of the program, uh, dealing with the direct communications with school districts. Uh, this week uh, was the first week of the program, and from our perspective, it went exceedingly well, uh, considering how complex the logistics are for the program. There were a few bumps in the road, uh, namely with the location of vaccination appointments. Uh, school staff are given codes, uh, but they are available uh, to make those appointments anywhere at any one of our clinics across the state. So um, what happened was that some of the, the slots filled up more quickly than others. Uh, but I just want to reassure people that new clinics will be implemented uh, as the supply uh, increases. So school staff should not worry about uh, getting an appointment if they were unable to schedule one this week. School staff are also eligible to register through the pharmacy program, so they should check back regularly uh, with those pharmacies to see if appointments are available through that program. We've implemented uh, a monthly survey to get a sense of the operating modes of our schools relative to the extent students are learning in person, hybrid, or through remote learning. And we recently compiled the data from the February survey, so I thought I'd provide a quick summary. The survey is given at the end of each month. In February, 77% of our schools responded to the survey. Uh, typically, we do see a slightly higher response rate of closer to 90%. But in February, uh, we saw slight increases in the amount of in-person instruction more or less across the board at all grade levels. Uh, for all students in K-12, for example, about 34% were learning through in-person, and this represents about a 4% increase over the amount of in-person that we saw in January. The same trend is apparent when the data is broken down by grade level. At the elementary level, uh, there was a 4% increase. The middle level it was about 3% and the high school 1%. I think the data does show that uh, schools have made it through the more challenging winter holiday period uh, with its elevated virus activity in January. And as the weather gets warmer and vaccination uh, expands, we can expect to see the amount of in-person to continue to increase in the coming weeks. Our team met this week with the Department of Health uh, to review possible edits to our safe and healthy schools guidance. Uh, no final decisions have been made at this point, but we are reviewing the guidance relative to entering into the recovery phase of our pandemic response. Much of this guidance document was created in the context of figuring out how to reopen our schools over the summer, and the document has grown to over 40 pages. And the last time we made edits to the document was in October, uh, right when we were trying to anticipate the holiday period. We have learned a lot since then. Uh, we must now plan for conditions improving. Also, there's always new information and data from the public health community to consider and evaluate. So we'll be working on that in the coming weeks and I'll provide an update on that soon. Uh, lastly, uh, we received uh, the expected waiver template form from the U.S. Department of Education this week relative to SBAC testing. Uh, the waiver form allows us to request a waiver from some of the testing provisions, but not the testing itself. Uh, with our priority on returning to in-person uh, this spring, we would have welcomed the opportunity to waive the testing altogether, uh, but the Biden administration will require states to hold the testing. 
Uh, we still intend to pursue waiver of some of the testing provisions, including a waiver of using data for accountability purposes. We will publish our waiver, waiver proposal soon. Uh, it must go through a public comment period, so there'll be plenty of opportunity for interested parties to give us feedback on our proposal. Uh, that concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'll update you on the overall progress of the state's vaccination program, as well as provide an update on the specific groups that have been recently uh, become eligible. I also wanted to share that when we near the completion of the groups we currently have in process, we plan to move back to our age uh, grouping strategy. We feel it's the most equitable, effective, and least divisive approach. We are targeting the end of March to transition back to age grouping, starting with Vermonters age 60 and above. But this, of course, all depends on the allocation, the, the vaccine allocation from the feds, that it continues and that it does increase uh, over time. In terms of overall progress, as of today, 138,700 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. That's one in every four Vermonters with at least one dose. 64,000 have received their first dose of vaccine. 64,900 have received their first dose of vaccine, and 73,700 have received their first and last doses. As you know, yesterday we opened up registration to those 16 and above with high-risk conditions. That means all of five phase, uh, phase five is open for registration. All of it is open now. As of this morning, 21,700 people in phase five, both segments A and B, have made appointments. I encourage those that are eligible to make an appointment via the state website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or by calling the vaccine call center at 855-722-7878. On Monday, March 8th, we opened registration to teachers and school staff, and we are expanding access to vaccine uh, clinics as, uh, as soon as possible. So far, 11,000 educators and child care providers have made appointments. As a reminder, these groups can make an appointment through the state system when, when an educator's uh, vac vaccination clinic has been scheduled, or they can make an appointment at Walgreens and bring their confirmation email to the appointment. The state website is health, uh, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, and the Walgreens website is walgreens.com. Next week, clinics, clinics have been scheduled in the following counties. Addison, Caledonia, Chittenden, Orleans, Rutland, and Wyndham. We have 25 additional sites pending and we will announce those once confirmed. We also opened up registration for childcare programs up ahead of the March 15th schedule. Eligible individuals have already received their instructions, and I want to provide some clarity of who's eligible, which includes the following. Individuals working in regulated child care programs who have direct contact with children, including registered and licensed family uh, child care home providers, teachers, teacher associates, aides, assistants, directors, after-school uh, after program staff, substitutes, and trainees. The following individuals are eligible if they have direct in-person contact with children, after-school activity specialists, auxiliary staff, business managers, and partner staff. Household members in a family child care home 16 years of age or older that have direct in-person contact with children are also eligible. The individuals must be working in a regulated child care, uh, regulated child care, preschool, or after school program that is currently operating and providing direct in-person care to children. 
Here are the individuals that are not eligible. Those that work in a regulated program but do not have regular, direct, in-person contact with children. Those employed by our program not currently providing in-person, direct care to children. Those that work in unregulated programs. And household members in a family child care center that do not have regular, uh, direct, and in-person contact with children. Vaccine clinics available to teachers and school staff are also available to regulated child care programs. They can make an appointment through the state system at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or by calling our call center at 855-722-7878 or through Walgreens at walgreens.com. And last but not least, we continue to expand opportunities for Vermonters to receive a vaccine. We have added clinics in Chester, Grand Isle, Ludlow, and Rockingham. CVS pharmacies in Vermont will join us in our vaccination efforts. Tomorrow, you can make an appointment at CVS locations in Barrie and Morrisville by visiting the health department's website or you can go to CVS website, the CVS website at cvs.com. Other CVS pharmacy locations will begin to schedule clinics as additional vaccine allocation becomes available through the federal retail pharmacy program. This concludes my update and I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Good morning. Today we're reporting 121 cases and one death, bringing the total deaths to 212. Our sympathies go to the deceased family and friends. There are 23 Vermonters who are hospitalized with COVID-19, with four in the ICU. These numbers continue to trend downwards. Our positivity rate also continues to trend downwards, and it stands today at 1.4%. You've now heard that the governor uh, has announced that Vermont is loosening gathering restrictions a bit. This will be welcomed by many to restore a greater sense of normal to our lives while we wait for the vaccine. To see family we don't live with, close friends, or let children play together in two household gatherings. But I want to reiterate that everyone in these gatherings who was not vaccinated still needs to follow our important prevention guidance, wearing masks, and keeping at least a six foot distance. Remember how well we did with this last summer and early fall before that first surge in cases. As Vermonters, we were able to live our lives while still taking those necessary steps to protect one another. I know we can do that again, especially with our progress in vaccination. But this virus has not gone away. We're still seeing cases of COVID-19, and we know we are now dealing with a more transmissible variant. So please, if you do get together with another household, keep it as safe as possible. Stay outside if you can. Choose activities where you can keep masks on and maintain your distance. Think about where you've been recently and whether it could put others at risk, especially if they are at higher risk. Remember the COVID talk? Have that conversation with others to negotiate boundaries and establish expectations before you get together. If you need a refresher, this is all still on our website at healthvermont.gov slash COVID talk tips. And of course, avoid any gathering if you have any symptoms of illness. Keep in mind that Vermont case growth, hospitalizations and deaths are all going in the right direction. Our level of immunity to the virus acquired through infection is probably the lowest in the nation, maybe 5% at best. So we really have to count on our very aggressive vaccination program and throughout the spring, our ability to avoid risky behaviors. Clearly on the order of 20 to 25% of our state now has an element of vaccine provided immunity. So total population immunity is now in a 25 to 30% range. We are currently probably seeing some element of the presence of variants 
and their increased transmissibility. But neither here in Vermont nor in the nation are these factors causing major increases in infections. And the final critical piece of our state reopening carefully still remains testing. Do not mistake the strides we're making in this pandemic to mean that we no longer need to worry about testing. The more we are around others again, the more we need to remember testing. You could have COVID-19 but not know it, and the only way to find out is to get tested. Then you can get the health guidance that you need for yourself while protecting your family and your community. We have plenty of capacity for testing right now across the state, so if you want to get tested for any reason, please do so. It's free and it's easy. We've been hearing a lot about different COVID-related anniversaries lately, from the first case in our state to reflecting on our own memories of the last normal activities we did before our lives changed in ways we could never have imagined. Yesterday marked a year since the WHO declared a pandemic as the new coronavirus spread quickly across countries and states. You may recall I was a little critical of their timing then, as they were the last to call it a pandemic. Since then, this pandemic has touched all of our lives, leading to suffering and loss, impacting physical and mental health, probably in ways we don't even know yet. But what is clear is that some people and communities have suffered more during the pandemic. People who were already struggling faced even more challenges of job loss or food insecurity, as you heard the Senator just say, had harder access to education and health care. Communities of color have been especially impacted. We can see in a way that we never had before how we are not all equally healthy, nor do we all have similar opportunities for good health. The conditions in the places where we live, learn, work, play, truly affect our health and outcomes. We've come a long way in this pandemic, and I only hope that as we emerge, we can continue to pay attention to these inequities and work to improve policies and programs to improve the health of all Vermonters. And the nice thing is, we already wrote some of the future playbook during the pre-pandemic time when we developed our state's health improvement plan which stands on a foundation of working across all sectors of state government and focusing on the so-called social determinants of health and addressing health equity. And finally, I'm happy to announce that I'm getting vaccinated today. We've been working so hard on vaccine and getting it to Vermonters that I've hardly had a moment to reflect on what it means to me. But like many of you, I look forward to spending time with family and friends, to seeing my out-of-state son and his wife, and my daughter and her husband, and hugging my granddaughter. And yes, hugging will be in order, and will be the doctor's order for all of you who follow in my footsteps. Like many of you, while I feel somewhat grateful for Zoom, it has not come even close to making up for missing seeing her grow from a five-month-old baby to a year-and-a-half toddler. I've said it before, but today I'll get to show it. These vaccines are safe and effective. It feels great to do my part in protecting my community and stopping the pandemic. I encourage all Vermonters to do the same as soon as they are eligible. Governor? Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Um, thanks, Governor. So in your, your opening remarks, you mentioned a uh, pandemic exit strategy. Um, I guess I'm just kind of wondering if, uh, if you could provide a little more clarification on, on what that means, whether that's a timeline for, you know, we have a timeline for, or next week potentially we'll have a timeline for vaccinations, but maybe if it's a timeline for the spigot. Yes, uh, this will be, 
uh, as I said, uh, next week, we hope when we get confirmation of what we're going to get for our supply and, and we can count on that, I'll be able to lay out uh, the vaccine strategy in detail. Um, hopefully the following week, uh, we, we have a plan all in place, uh, ready for an exit strategy. How do we get uh, between here and what I think is normal um, and, and very normal uh, by 4th of July? I think I said that last week, um, that that's our goal um, to fully back to normal. So we will have a very detailed plan and it'll show uh, just exactly in phases where we're going to be, uh, what the gathering limits will be, uh, and uh, what we can do during those periods of time. But uh, again, it will be very detailed uh, and it'll be very transparent. But that'll be uh, before so probably the first week of April um, by the time we are able to deliver that. But vaccine supply has to come first. And um, on a side note, I had a question about the 1099Gs as well. Um, I understand those were sent out, maybe this is for Commissioner Harrington as well, but I understand those were sent out a few weeks ago. Uh, we're still hearing from some people and their family members that haven't received them. Uh, of course, the new stimulus checks and other things will be based off of your 2020 income. So, um, you know, we're hearing concerns that, you know, people might not get them in time to file their, their taxes. I'm wondering where, where we are on that process and if there's anything holding it up. Uh, I'll refer to uh, Commissioner Harrington on that, if you heard the question. I did not, Governor. It was about the it's just uh, hard to hear. Yeah, 1099s. Uh, there, uh, Calvin was saying that he's hearing from some of their listeners that they have not received them yet, and uh, just wanted to know if there was an update on that, or if there's a reason why some may not have received theirs. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, most, uh, well, all the 1099s that we had uh, good addresses for went out the door. Um, there was a small population of folks um, where we had to reach back out to them to validate their addresses. Um, there is an opportunity if someone did not receive a 1099 on our website uh, where they can request the 1099 if for some reason they didn't get it. But like I said, there was a, um, when I say a small population, I believe it was, you know, less than 1,000 people. Uh, out of 100,000 uh, where we had um, bad addresses in the system just based on how the application was filed, and we had to uh, try to validate those addresses. So when we ran our cross-check uh, against other um, data sources we had, both at the DMV and at the Department of Taxes, uh, we were able to find this subset of people where the, the address didn't match. So we are also um, pulling that information uh, and cross-checking that to get some more out the door. Um, and that'll happen probably over the course of the next week. But certainly if someone did not receive one and they know they should have, uh, they can request that uh, on our website. One last, actually, follow-up to the spigot announcement today uh, with restaurants. Does, does that include bars as well? It does not include uh, bars at this point in time, but I can say that uh, you can expect a turn of the spigot in that res uh, regard in the very near future. Steve? Coming up, so um, on, the, uh, on the issue of um, these vaccination clinics for health care, uh, excuse me, um, uh, teachers and, um, and school staff as well as child care, uh, is there any uh, problem with notifications on the child care end of things, uh, child care centers being being notified. Uh, I've received a few uh, comments from child care centers, specifically in Addison County, where they could not, uh, they did not have uh, a chance to sign up at the Addison County stuff because they weren't aware of them, uh, whereas the teachers were. Yeah, I believe we just, just started uh, the child care providers uh, this week. So, uh, I would expect that would change uh, as the week moves on, but maybe I'll refer to Secretary Smith. Yeah, we decided to release them because uh, there were opportunities at the federal pharmacy programs, and we decided to release the instructions, as you know, 
there's different instructions for educators as well as child care providers um, because we have specific areas where they can go and specific clinics that they can go to. So we release those early. It may be the, you know, as we were releasing them, they, they may have run into some aspects of, uh, uh, of some of those clinics being full. But I would, I would, check, I would check the federal pharmacy program uh, to see if there's any spots there. Of course, as we move on, you know, we'll start adding clinics. And, and again, we have to uh, abide by what is given to us by the federal government in terms of allocation. Remember, we had an extended period of time that we were going to get this group done into April. And uh, we, you know, I think we said either the first or second week in April. So it's going to take some time to get through this group. We anticipated getting, taking time to get through this group. Uh, we will continue to uh, open up clinics as we go around the state. As I said, we had several counties where we'll be opening up uh, in, in next week, and we'll continue to open up clinics. Right. Uh, they, they were more concerned about the fact they, they did receive their identification numbers, all of that stuff, but what they were having problems with was knowing that there was a clinic coming that they could then, uh, you know, apply for. Yeah. We'll look at that, Steve, and make sure our communications, as you know, whenever you roll out a new program, there are a few people that, that, um, that have glitches. Uh, you know, it's not, not any fault of theirs. It's just we, we need to uh, figure out how the communications went on that, and we'll, we'll continue to communicate uh, with them, especially in Addison County, from what I'm hearing. Okay. Yeah, I think it highlights the difficulty in, uh, in you know, doing specific groups, special groups, um, the complexity gets more challenging uh, in making sure that you, know, you have to develop a new program every time you do that. Uh, so that's why we're going back uh, to the age banding, which is so much more concise and easier to understand. It's based on age. Liz, NBC5. Hi there. Um, now that people 16 and older with certain underlying conditions can register for the vaccine, I'm wondering if the state has considered opening eligibility to the parents or spouses of those people since that household could still be considered high risk. Secretary Smith. I mean, I'll call on Dr. Levine if he has anything to add as well. But, you know, I'd like to vaccinate every Vermonter today. Uh, but we do have a limited supply of vaccine that we have to apportion out according, you know, as we did uh, where the greatest, uh, greatest risk is. And the greatest risk in many of these cases um, are one age, and you saw us go from 65 above because 90% of our deaths, and then high risk conditions is another one. Um, we want to get to the people that have high risk conditions and um, with the vaccine supply that we have, we feel we can get to those people, but we can't expand it to other people within, within that uh, family. Um, and then I did have a question from a viewer who wrote in to us saying that she couldn't make her second dose of appointment that she had originally scheduled and she wasn't able to make an appointment in that ideal time frame. Just wondering if there's any sort of solution for that. Yeah, I, it would, did she indicate whether it was, I doubt it was through the state program because we, we hold back the second doses um, and make sure there are second doses. Um, did she indicate whether it was through the pharmacy program or through the state program? She didn't indicate. Okay, well, maybe I can, talk to you afterwards and we can get there. But I want to I want to turn it over to Dr. Levine to talk about, because we've had a lot of questions about this. It, it's not the exact date. It may be uh, a few days later or a few days, or, you know, mostly it's a few days later. I'd like Dr. Levine to sort of uh, reiterate what, he's, what he has said before about that particular um, issue. We all know that in healthcare, precision is really a good thing. We don't want to get an extra milliliter of the vaccine if we don't need it, nor do we want to get only half the dose of the vaccine if we don't need it. Uh, in this case, precision has a little wiggle room when it comes to the actual timing of the dose. Um, I have heard similar stories uh, from uh, others in Vermont. Um, I have to say that, as the Secretary was alluding to, um, most of those 
uh, end up getting resolved pretty easily, and they were often systems with the computer systems that one of the pharmacies was using and not an intentional neglect of any sort. But the reality is um, the Pfizer is a three-week uh, to the second dose, the Moderna is four weeks to the second dose, and all of the, the companies as well as the CDC agree that you can err on the side of several days before or after, and if, God forbid, it came to the point where it was six weeks after, that's still acceptable, even if it's not ideal. Uh, so I want people to just feel comfortable that they have a window of time, and that precision there is not necessarily going to do anything uh, in their favor or against them. Uh, the reality is, uh, as you know, some places around the world are actually intentionally holding the second doses and doing their own experiment with the population at large to see if they can wait as long as four months after uh, the first dose, and we'll learn from their experience. Um, but uh, in this country, six weeks would be the outlier, and uh, people should feel comfortable if they can be within a few days on either side of their dose. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the lag time between um, registering for an appointment for your first dose and, and actually getting the vaccine. I know someone who with chronic condition 65 and up who made an appointment recently and I think is um, scheduled for the first shot on March 31st. Is that sort of standard for that group now? And will that or does it depend on sort of where you're registering, where you live, um, how much vaccine the state has? And do you anticipate that speeding up at all when we get to the age group again? Yeah, I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer this, but uh, we have run into that in some situations, and we would encourage uh, those who are signing up, if they don't find one in their region, in their area, uh, th of that uh, specific time period, that they look elsewhere if they can. If they can travel, they can go to some other uh, area and get it sooner, they should. And uh, I think that that's been a little bit of confusion on the part of, of some, but um, Secretary Smith. Yeah, Lisa, thank you for the question. I just wanted to point out that there is a, in this, in this group, um, the high risk conditions, there is a verification process that is in place. So what happens, that takes a few days to verify. So they, what happens, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't allow you to sign up on a, uh, a certain amount, uh, a certain day until that verification process is, is complete. So that is part of, um, um, part of the issue. Second of all, uh, these clinics have been filling up fast. Um, you know, we have 21,000 people who have signed up for these. We usually, depending on supply, will open up more clinics and we'll see, we get a, you know, the federal government as the governor, as the governor had mentioned is, we're gonna have a pretty pl flat supply here uh, for the next uh, few weeks. And then at the end of the March, we hope to have a bigger supply. So maybe we can move up the clinics at, at that point, but right now, um, there are two processes that are in place. There's the verification process that takes a few days, and then um, you know the the supply uh, where we had been hoping for a consistent supply of Johnson and Johnson that just hasn't materialized over the last couple of weeks or the next couple of weeks. And we're hoping, uh, according to what um, the federal government is saying, that will change at the end of the end of March. Okay, and as the governor was saying that you you could you could register at another uh, location that's not the closest one to you, because I know um, that you have said uh, yeah. in the early phases of this that you should really stick to the vaccine site that's closest to you. Yeah, we're getting a little bit more liberal on that, uh, primarily because we're trying we're trying to sort of uh, balance out where we have. Uh, where we have slots and where we don't have slots. Obviously, we would prefer that you try to do the, the and this is on the, um, f these are on the open programs, which, which I'll, you know, which would be the age banding programs and the, um, uh, well, it would be with any program. 
but you know we would ask you to first try around your area but you know we, we want people to get vaccinated and we don't want open slots so if there's somebody that needs to get vaccinated that wants to get vaccinated that wants to drive um, if they're in Lamoille to Chittenden County um, we're not going to discourage that okay thank you Thank you, Rebecca. Good morning, Governor. Um, Governor, I'm, I'm wondering if the state is looking at um, opening up spectators for any sort of championship games. It, it would seem that with a lot of the older population, grandparents and, and whatnot being vaccinated, that uh, facilities like the Barry Auditorium or uh, uh, maybe a large hockey rink could accommodate some vaccinated spectators. Yeah, this is uh, one of those what ifs uh, questions, and uh, we aren't there at this point in time. Uh, and again, I would ask uh, for some patience as we get through the next couple of weeks when we can confirm the amount of supply we're going to get, and then we can we'll lay out our strategy over the next. Uh, two to three months, and it'll, it'll get uh, very prescriptive, and you'll be able to see what we're looking at in terms of gathering sizes and what it means for those who are vaccinated or not. So, uh, again, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not allowing that at this point in time, uh, but it won't be long before you'll see some, um, some steps in, in some steps. You know, allowing for group gatherings uh, and, uh, and then getting to some sort of normalcy by midsummer or 4th of July from my standpoint. Okay. Um, and the other question I have is we're, we're seeing some school closings, uh, sports being canceled for the rest of the season, most notably at the Siskoi School District. I'm wondering uh, what sort of light you can shed on that situation and, and what sort of knowledge the state has. Uh, Commissioner Levine. Hi, I presume you're referring to the sport of hockey? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing that there's, uh, you know, quite a few cases through some of the, the sports teams, especially hockey team, uh, mm -hmm. and and it's led to the, the closure of, of uh, school for the next possibly 28 days. Yeah, I'll, I'm not sure about the school closure part for 28 days, uh, unless Secretary French has some insight into that. But with regard to the teams themselves, uh, you are correct that there have been cases on several hockey teams. We know of transmission only uh, within a team as opposed to between teams, uh, like in competition. And uh, as you know, sometimes um, because of a case or several cases on a team, there are abundant contacts because uh, the team is a team. And depending on how they were practicing or scrimmaging or playing, um, the amount of opportunity for players to come in contact with one another is increased. But um, at this point in time, um, we're not aware of any uh, cases transmitted within a competition across teams. Uh, Secretary uh, French, do you have anything to add regarding Missisquoi? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, yes, uh, Greg, uh, the superintendent in the region uh, reached out to me the other day and just uh, gave me a heads up that they're having trouble uh, with staff availability, essentially, as a result of the number of cases they've seen in the community. Uh, we have uh, scheduled a time for next week for the two of us to connect and so we can explore our options, see what we can do to help. Uh, but my understanding, it's the impact of uh, the spread of the virus on our staffing patterns. Thank you very much. I'll uh, leave it as that. Thank you, Governor, and have a great weekend. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Thanks for taking my call. Governor Scott, you've said that you want people to have a choice in which vaccine they get. For those people who do have a preference for which vaccine, how can they know which one they're getting? Our, re our readers report that there's no indication of which one they'll get when they're registering. Yeah, that's going to, um, we're working out the details of that uh, right now, uh, but it's really not, in some respects, not an option because we, 
we only received the first um, first tranche of doses uh, from the federal government, which was about four to five thousand doses. So we don't have that many in place, and we've utilized uh, most of those for uh, some of the 1A population, um, the public safety, and and so forth, the expansion of public safety. So. Uh, we don't have any uh, to have a choice uh, at this point in time. But we expect, again, when the federal government uh, becomes more clear about what we can expect in the future, we're developing a plan uh, so that you can, you'll can you know uh, or we'll make sure that uh, certain um, certain uh, distribution points will, will have enough of the doses there to give you a, a choice. But we just haven't worked out all the details yet. But we're, we have some time because, as I said, we're not getting any um, uh, any significant amount uh, this next week, nor the week after, and there's no promises on the week after that. So uh, we'll uh, we'll hopefully know more on Tuesday, and then we can talk a little bit more about what the uh, what the opportunities are. Thank you. And my other question is for Dr. Levine. The CDC and Vermont Vaccination Advisory Committee recommended that a BMI of 30 be considered obese in terms of qualifying as a chronic health condition. Why did Vermont use a BMI of 40? Yeah, thank you. So uh, 30 is a traditional definition, if you will, of obesity, and 40 is a definition of what's termed severe obesity. Um, and we felt that um, based on discussions with our advisory group, as well as uh, looking at all of the data, that it would be best to keep it to the severe obesity group, and that way we could get quickly to back to our age banding as well, um, because there would not be as many uh, individuals to go through in that group. Okay, thank you very much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor, good afternoon. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, it, I, received this question a number of times. Uh, can you mandate that the schools reopen in a similar way that you mandated they closed a year ago and you're just leaving it up to the districts at this point or do you not have that authority? Yeah, it would be very difficult uh, to mandate that. And uh, from my standpoint, I think uh, it's much better uh, for us to deal with this. Uh, giving some latitude to the districts. We have a different policy in Vermont, uh, you know, much more local control, and we want to uh, observe that. And uh, so we've taken this different, uh, we've, we knew the obstacle, the, the main obstacle in the way of reopening, uh, as we've heard over the last uh, month or so, uh, has been to vaccinate education, uh, the education system, uh, the employees and staff of those uh, of the education community. Um, so with the Johnson Johnson coming on, uh, being approved, um, we thought uh, this was the best approach. So once we get through that obstacle, which we're trying to deal with right now, uh, we believe that there are going to be more schools uh, coming on board, opening up for in-person instruction, and we'll work with them uh, with other obstacles that may be in the way and uh, to accommodate that. So we just think it's a better approach um, and to force someone to do this at this point in time doesn't make a lot of sense from my standpoint. We, we haven't used that uh, except to close. Uh, we haven't used that uh, approach in anything we've done. And we've had some good compliance and I expect we'll have a lot of compliance in some respects in those schools reopening because they know our, our education community knows that's what's best for our kids. I mean, they're, they're not okay. Uh, they're suffering at this point in time. And uh, by opening to in-person instruction, uh, it will be best for the uh, emotional uh, and educational uh, needs of our kids. I, I think the, one, of, one of the parts of the question, whether you could legally yeah, do you that know, I, I don't. I don't have the answer to that. I assume okay. uh, the powers are broad. I, I assume uh, that, uh, that we could, uh, but I'm not sure that we'll, we'd have the results uh, that we'd hoped for. Um, nor, you know, this unity uh, that we've enjoyed in Vermont. Uh, you know, we've come together. We've, we've adhered to the guidelines. We've done a lot of things uh, right, and, uh, and this approach has worked thus far. So uh, I'm in hopes that this approach, once we vaccinate the school system, the education uh, employees, the staff members, and so forth, 
uh, that we'll see uh, a large majority of those schools opening back up to in-person instruction. An unrelated uh, question uh, that I've received is uh, a woman who's pregnant right now gets a dose and should she be concerned that the second dose would come after the baby's delivered and whether she could breastfeed and, and that sort of thing? Definitely a question for Dr. Levine. <clears throat> yes, it's been determined that uh, breastfeeding is not a contraindication to getting a dose uh, and one can safely get vaccinated even if they're breastfeeding. All right, great, thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Uh, thanks, thanks for Rebecca. Uh, Vermonters uh, get a lot of numbers thrown at them at these press briefings, but one or two more significant numbers are completely missing, uh, especially when the state is pushing for the return of teachers to schools for total in-person learning. And I'm just wondering what the Agency of Education or the Health Department have for numbers of schools across Vermont that have a current active COVID case or, and what does the state know about schools that are operating remotely or in full operation? I think a lot I mean, of that's- We don't seem to hear those. I think that a lot of that's on the website, Mike, from what I've seen, but maybe I'm wrong. Secretary French? Yeah, your first question, Mike, about the number of cases in schools, that's on the Department of Health's website. It's updated, I think, twice a week. Um, and in terms of uh, to what extent we have remote or in-person or not, we do monitor that on a monthly basis. It is, it's fairly dynamic variable, so it's hard for us to uh, pin that down at a specific moment in time. So we decide to do that on a monthly basis to give a sense of the general trends. Well, I know the Champlain Valley Superintendents Association this morning had a meeting and 13 out of 14 raised their hand when asked if they have an active case in their school today. So 13 out of 14 have, and more than half that they have one or more classes fully remote because of quarantine requirements. So I'm, I'm told the school districts are doing their own contract tracing because of delays at the health department and their tracing. So is this part of the reason that the superintendents say there's a disconnect between schools and the state? No, I would, I would say again that the information's on the website. Um, I would also observe the Champlain Valley Superintendents region is one of the largest regions. It starts all the way uh, in Middlebury and goes all the way up to the Canadian border. So you're talking a large number of our school districts. Uh, but the data is there. Um, and we, we still see cases in the schools on a daily basis. And uh, to their credit, uh, it's being managed exceedingly well. It's, it's unfortunately, to a certain extent, become just uh, part and parcel of our operations. But uh, it takes a lot of effort to do that. Uh, but schools are doing a great job managing it. And, and as far as the schools taking over the contract tracing from the health department? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. For? No, that's that's not true. Um, and I'll invite Secretary Smith or Dr. Levine to weigh in on that. But uh, we still do all the contact tracing at the Department of Health. Dr. Levine. Well, not not according to superintendents I've talked to. They can't wait. They tell me from. Yeah, Mike, it's a collaborative. You know, do their own. It's a collaboration between the schools and the Department of Health, because you are correct. Um, there are times that at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night, the schools want to know and need to know what impact that's going to have on their operation. And they do that preliminary contact tracing. We have an entire team that is our school outbreak prevention and response team that interacts with the schools constantly and has been very tightly connected with them. So. Um, it is a collaboration, and it's a productive collaboration, um, and it works very well, actually, and it's been working all, all year for, through the pandemic. Well, so so I, I want you to view it as a collaboration, not a disconnect, as you framed it. Well, I'm just talking to superintendents who see a disconnect there, but my other question today, uh, and I know we've talked about cashiers, food handlers at grocery stores. 
have been considered essential workers, but these low-paid employees don't seem to get a lot of attention in getting shots. I'm not quite sure as to, or can you say what is the clear message today for these workers as to when these people on the front lines are going to get their shots and when they're eligible and everything? Well, again, Mike, I think we've seen, you know, with the child care providers and and so forth, a uh, level of complexity when you have to determine exactly who it is that is going to be able to receive those. And uh, not having that finite list is uh, problematic. So we want to go back to the age banding. Uh, it's just so clear, so concise, so easily to easy to understand. Uh, and we get requests all the time. And I think you can make an argument for almost any uh, category as being essential, essential to someone. And I, I think we shared with all of you uh, the number of uh, entities that have officially reached out uh, to our office uh, to ask to be put to the front of the line. I mean, we have you know a couple pages here. It's probably um, 60 entities, and, and I'll just give you a flavor. I mean, and again, you can make an argument for each and every one. Uh, the HVAC uh, contractors, heating and ventilating, air conditioning contractors, when you think about schools, you know, want to make sure that they can get in to uh, provide for that relief. Uh, pilots, uh, college professors, hotel employees, postal workers, grocery store workers, food and beverage staff, food distribution uh, drivers, forest product workers, uh, let's see, cleaning industry yeah, workers. But for wait, wait a second, let me finish. Communications yeah, sure, workers, yeah. uh, pharmacists, uh, hardware stores, dairy workers, uh, U.S. Border, um, 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 border Patrol and Customs, uh, again, library staff. I mean, each and every one. And that's just a small portion of the number of requests we get. And so you can make an argument for each and every one. But then you have to, if you decide you're going to do that, then you have to, de you have to decide who gets it, how do you get the names, how are you going to do it, and how are you going to get them to sign up. And then it's a level of complexity that slows down the process. So going back to the age banding, as I said, uh, um, we're, we feel we're going to have the opportunity to have everyone sign, at least signed up by May 1st. That's like you know, six weeks away. So we'll get there. Um, we just need to have some patience and, and understand. We've been through you know, virtually uh, a year now, uh, and for the most of that time, we didn't have a vaccine available. And we were able to keep fairly safe during the summer, and it escalated uh, into uh, January, uh, December and January. And we put extra mitigation measures in place uh, to counteract that. But now we have the, the vaccines. We've been able to get to the chronic conditions, those with underlying conditions, as well as those in uh, high-risk categories like age, uh, 65 and over. I remember when we announced that, uh, many people said, uh, I think uh, Secretary Smith had announced we'll, we'll be through that, we'll be able, able to get through all of that uh, in March. And many doubted that we'd be able to do that. But we accomplished that, and we're going to accomplish it, and we're going to be able to get everyone at least signed up, have the opportunity to be able to sign up um, before May. So. I'm just asking for patience. Uh, we think it's this, the easiest way and the fastest way for us to get through this. Um, but, uh, but I understand everyone wants to be put to the front of the line. And you can make an argument that everyone is essential in some way um, when you make those arguments. Well, uh, and my mother being a librarian, I uh, will probably, uh, probably shouldn't be saying this, but you know, librarians, they're worthy people, but when you have cashiers working every single day providing food and drink and everything to people, that seems to be a higher priority. And, and on that list that you were reading from are, you know, massage therapists, spa workers, minors, things like that, that I think people would have a hard time trying to put them up at the top of the list. We, we get flooded with questions from cashiers at grocery stores wondering, and I guess we're not hearing an answer today as to when they might. I just, I think I told you, to by, by May 1st, they should be able to sign up. I think that's the answer. Okay. With it, you know, it's like six weeks okay. away. Okay. 
Thank you, everybody, very much. Appreciate it. Pat, WCAX. Hi. I have a clarification on vaccine clinics at schools. How are you deciding which school districts have those clinics on site, and is the shortage of Johnson & Johnson forcing you to cancel any of those? Secretary Smith. We've had, we have not had the, we have not canceled any, um, uh, any vaccine clinics that we have uh, announced. So there's been no cancellation. I'll turn it over to um, uh, Secretary French on how, the, how sort of the process works in terms of where and when uh, vaccine clinics are, are done. Now, we, you know, we, we have to wait for Johnson & Johnson, so our planning is waiting, you know, we, we're always planning clinics. We're always in the background planning. And we're, what we're trying to do is make sure we match the clinics with the, the amount of vaccine that's coming in. So the answer is, are we, are we continuing to plan? Uh, yes, we continue the plan. Have we, deploy, have we canceled any uh, clinics that have been deployed? The answer is no, and I'll turn it over to Secretary French for um, any additional insight into how those are put together. Yeah, thanks, Secretary Smith. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a complex process to say the least, uh, and now certainly uh, tightly driven by uh, the supply variations. Uh, but we knew, um, you know, that we need to use uh, uh, all the tools we have in our toolkit, so to speak, to uh, get the vaccine out as quickly as possible. So that's sort of the first thing to acknowledge that there's multiple uh, configurations of clinics, whether they be mass vaccination sites, uh, health district offices, of course, the pharmacy program, and so forth. So um, it really is the planning process starts with uh, the sort of the consideration of the inventory and information of the uh, state emergency operations center intersecting with uh, data from the agency of education to put that together. But it's it's this week was the first week. Um, we're quickly moving into uh, a period where it'll be. Uh, certainly driven by the specific supply of the vaccines that's available. I guess, you know, I'm thinking like, okay, you know, there's a clinic in Jericho at Mount, you know, Mount Mansfield. Um, you know, why would they have one and not say like South Burlington or Burlington or something like that? Or, you know, so just trying to get a sense of how you choose which um, districts you're going to right now. Yeah, and it is a good example, uh, like at the Mount Mansfield area, that functions as a regional clinic. As much as it's housed in a specific district, we have to consider a number of clinics to be deployed in the uh, immediate Chittenden County region uh, due to the density of population of educators. So we have the information for the districts, uh, and then we have to map out uh, the logistics, find locations, uh, and, and once again, use a variety of our delivery uh, and logistics uh, systems to ensure that we have enough vaccine in the area to uh, meet the need. And the last question related to school vaccine doses is probably going to be one that Secretary Smith might take on. Are you still only using the so-called extra doses, those from Johnson & Johnson and going through the federal pharmacy program to Walgreens for educators? Or are there vaccines now coming out of the general pool of vaccine doses that the state is getting that were initially tagged for the high-risk Vermonters? Um, well, I know this was initially pitched as kind of a parallel vaccination track with separate sources of doses. It appears based on how this rollout is going that the high-risk Vermonters and educators are really both kind of lumped into phase five. Not really, Kat. We, we had extra doses of Pfizer that were left over from the long-term care facility. Um, that we have rolled into the system now. We recaptured those from the federal pharmacy program and rolled those into the system. So you will see in the, in the sort of the rollout of this, um, we have used Pfizer because uh, Pfizer will have three weeks until your second dose. And then, you know, we, we have scheduled for the second week of April to be through all this. So we, we started with Pfizer and a lot from the long-term care facility left over and clawback, I would call it, from the federal pharmacy program. We do, you know, we had expected uh, a continuing supply of Pfizer. We are using some of our Pfizer supply that came in the first week. And as the governor had mentioned, our Pfizer supply has sort of dried up a little bit uh, for the next couple of weeks. We're anticipating that will come in in, um, in larger amounts at the end of the month and we'll finish up uh, the, um, 
the clinics, the education clinics then. So we're using a combination of Pfizer and, um, and Johnson & Johnson. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify there. You said the supply of Pfizer has dried up? No, I'm sorry. I am sorry. I meant Johnson & Johnson. If I said that, then I was wrong. Okay, so just to be clear, though, for people, the vaccines that were still targeted for high-risk Vermonters are, in fact, going to high-risk Vermonters. Yeah, the, 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 there's enough vaccine going to high-risk Vermonters, given the, uh, the, given the registration that we have. Thank we're, you. Kat, Kat, I just want to make sure. We always are adjusting uh, based upon the registration. So where we, you know, we'll use, we'll use vaccine where it's needed. Uh, but we're always adjusting. But for the bulk of uh, starting the, the education and child care program, we used, we put back into the system the, uh, the extra Pfizer doses. But we will continue to adjust. If, if we see that we have extra in one program, we'll move to other programs. For example, we, you know, at the end of the month, we said we may move to 60. We'll adjust based upon what we have available at that point. Got it. Thanks. Devin, Local 22. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Levine. Can you hear me? We can. Um, so President Biden said the U.S. could be celebrating its independence from the pandemic on July 4th. And I'm sure, especially by that point, a lot of people will be wanting to forget this past year. But from a public health perspective, I'm interested to hear if that timeline plays out, how much of your work and the work of other public health leaders is still going to be COVID focused beyond that date, uh, whether that's getting a better grasp of the long-term COVID symptoms, the widespread mental health impact. Um, so basically when the work on preventing the spread is easier because people are vaccinated, have you given a lot of thought on what your responsibility and the Department of Health's responsibility will still be when it comes to keeping all of those loose ends that are left behind um, sort of in the spotlight so we don't forget the toll the virus has taken. Before Dr. Levine answers, I just want to uh, again reiterate uh, that we believe in Vermont uh, by the 4th of July we'll be back to much more normal than the president had described last night. I think he had described um, maybe getting together for cookouts and small gatherings uh, at home. Um, we believe we'll be at that point in April um, and we'll be uh, able to open up to much more normal if everything holds up from a supply standpoint uh, by 4th of July. Thanks for that question um, because you're right, the virus doesn't all of a sudden disappear July 4th. Um, it'll still be here on the planet Earth. The bottom line is, though, we do expect that summer will be a time when there is a tremendous amount of suppression of virus activity, partially because of the natural immunity those who've been infected have, for a big portion related to the vaccine-produced immunity that we get from vaccination, and the fact that uh, cases are going down now, as we've talked about, and there's uh, hopefully going to be less virus circulating. The whole goal of what we need to do for the future is really now. This joint pathway of keeping ourselves protected by following all of our guidance and preventing in future infections with vaccination, but making sure that the level of virus activity is so low that the virus doesn't have a chance to be transmitted between people and then have mutations that could become active and uh, keep it going in populations of people. So our health department uh, won't ever be able to take its eye off of this during the course of 2021. Um, doesn't mean that this is forever into the future, but certainly this year, we're all gonna be watching very closely in the fall to make sure as weather changes and people congregate again and what have you that um, there's not a lot of increase in viral activity. But the anticipation is that from a health department standpoint, the amount of our workforce that's dedicated to COVID, which is literally an all hands on deck experience, even though not each person is doing 100% COVID, they're still doing the jobs that they've come from, 
uh, the percentage of the workforce will decrease that's dedicating itself specifically to COVID. And we'll be able to have a more uh, COVID division, if you will, within our health surveillance that's able to do all of the uh, epidemiologic work uh, of managing this uh, virus uh, that we would normally do. Much like all year round, uh, the various uh, microorganisms that cause food poisoning and GI illnesses, we follow all the time. The illnesses that are caused by ticks and mosquitoes, um, they may be active more in the uh, summer and fall and spring, but we follow them year round and we have lots of work to do with them. Every year we have to deal with flu shots and flu influenza season and the impact of the flu on the population. COVID will become like one of those groups. Uh, and it will never go away. It will be something that people say, oh yeah, I had a case of the flu. Well, I had a case of the COVID um, you know, last week and that's why you didn't see me or what have you. Um, it's gonna become that way and hopefully more and more people will be vaccinated and there'll be a higher level of resistance. Kids will be able to be vaccinated because the trials will be over and we'll find that there are vaccines that are safe and effective in that population. And that's the way the future will evolve. So I hope I've answered your question without being too wordy. Yes, thank you both, appreciate it. That's all I had. John Dillon, VPR. Thank you. Uh, Governor, I was trying to get a sense of how you expect um, the legislature will review the, the, the big, big chunk of federal money that um, will be coming in. Do you do you think it's going to be, do you expect you'll be dividing it up into tranches for legislative review? Um, I know there's, it comes in over time, three years, I think, for some of it. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, we're in the middle of the session and I'm trying to get a sense of, of what they'll be asked to do, what, whether you'll have a plan for some of the money initially uh, and so forth. Yeah, a couple of things, John. Uh, first of all, uh, it's my understanding that the bulk, uh, two bulks of, of uh, dollars will be this year and next year. Um, so we won't get it all uh, in the in the first uh, in the, the next couple of months. So we'll um, we'll have to work from there. Now, remember, as uh, Senator Sanders had described, um, a lot of the money, uh, let's say, if it's 1.25 billion. A lot of that is going to be sent direct to Vermonters um, in terms of the $1,400 per person, uh, and that's per family. I mean, per family as well is going to get an increased amount. Uh, so uh, I'd say the bulk of the uh, of the dollars is going directly to Vermonters, and then um, we uh, we're working our way through uh, some of uh, the details that we know about right now. Uh, but just again, keep in mind when. Congress passes something, much like the legislature does, uh, there are always rules that follow afterwards. Um, when we received the first package, for instance, uh, we found out over the period of months uh, what the rules were going to be associated with the money that we're receiving. Um, so we want to respect the process. I know some states, uh, the governor has control of the money and can disperse it in any way they want. Uh, we wanted to respect the process in Vermont, uh, the way we've done things, and and uh, work with the legislature on how to disperse whatever funds are available. And we'll continue to do that here from my standpoint. So we'll see what happens um, with, the, uh, with the money uh, once we get a few more details and be able to uh, develop a plan. But we're working on what what our priorities are going to be, and we will engage with the legislature uh, sooner rather than later so they understand what we think should happen. I mean, broadband would be a high priority, uh, but there are other, uh, you know, there's money in there for our businesses, uh, for the hospitality sector in particular uh, that uh, is most at risk, uh, that we want to make sure that they get the money just as quick as they possibly can. So. Time will tell, um, but uh, hopefully we'll have more answers as the uh, the days and weeks progress. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know they're working on a broadband bill now, so would you advise the committees 
to wait and see if they can add more money to that bill or yeah, I would for, yeah you know, a few months from now. Yeah, uh, it would be my recommendation to continue to work on that bill. You can always add money to it. As you remember, uh, yeah. we started this uh, with uh, with our proposal to the legislature uh, in the budget. So we had put uh, it was like thirty million, twenty thirty million dollars into the into broadband in our budget. They took off from there, and they're they're working out some of the details. And I think they wanted to add some money uh, with this package uh, coming through. And again, we'll have to see what the details are. Uh, we may want to add further, uh, but having a longer period of time to deal with that is important, uh, and broadband's important, but we're not going to get it all done in the first year, I don't believe. We won't be able to disperse all the money in the first year, uh, so we'll take uh, some time to get it right. And, uh, and, and again, uh, you know, the priority at this point would be a, a recovery uh, for those businesses in the hospitality sector uh, to make sure that they can make it until uh, until July 4th uh, and uh, and so that they're still in business so people can go back to work and we can um, bring you know more revenue in to their coffers which means more money coming into our coffers as well so uh, again um, we'll uh, we'll engage the legislature um, and it took a turn uh, as well you know the house version uh, from what I understand uh, from congressman Welch was, was a little bit more flexible, um, and then the Senate was a little bit more prescriptive. Uh, so, again, we'll have to see what that means uh, to us. Um, but um, but we'll we'll work out those details, and we'll work with the legislature to make sure that we uh, prioritize and get the the money in the hands of those in greatest need first. And, okay, thank you. Is there an update? Uh, also on, on Newport, the outbreak at the correctional facility, and, and has that outbreak changed at all? You're thinking about vaccinating inmates. Yeah, it hasn't changed uh, my outlook. Uh, it has been decrease, decreasing. I think Secretary Smith can give us uh, the numbers at this point in time. Uh, but as I described before, um, we're going to be moving to the age back to the age banding. Uh, we think that's the simplest, uh, most efficient and effective process, easily understood and uh, everyone will be a part of that. We've been vaccinating by population in the offender population as well. Uh, so we, uh, we hope uh, by, by May 1st, uh, everyone will be uh, uh, signed up. And, uh, and you know, shortly after that, within the next few weeks after that, um, they'll have shots in arms. So uh, we think this is the most efficient uh, process and we're going to stick with that. Secretary Smith. Yeah, John, uh, we um, we will be moving, and I and I will get the precise number from from corrections. But we will be moving approximately 106 of those inmates out of isolation. Um, they'll be out of medical isolation into a uh, new pod um, uh, because they've gone past their COVID uh, period. Uh, so we're going to be moving. Uh, that population today, as as the governor said, and I'll get that specific number to you. Um, as the governor said, um, you know, the, we we have uh, we're in the process of vaccinating along with um, the various age bandings that we have done, and now that those with high risk conditions are um, are going to be vaccinated, we anticipate that there will be a large uh, a number of uh, inmates that will be falling into that uh, category. I don't have the exact number now, uh, but we'll be, uh, it's going to be much uh, more than have been vaccinated so far. 37 in-state uh, inmates have been vaccinated so far through the age banding, and we'll continue to do that through the high-risk conditions. But it will be, it will be quite a bit more than 37. Thank you both for your time. Song, Compass, Vermont. Thank you. Um, on March 2nd at the press conference, uh, you did some projections for us of the amount of doses of the vaccine that were coming in. At that time, you had said that uh, that first week in March, you expected 20,000 doses. 
followed uh, in the second week by 25,000 doses, and then an expectation by the end of March to be to 35,000. Uh, can you give us an update on what the latest projections are? Yeah, th I don't know if that, you know, we'll, we'll go back and take a look, but uh, that isn't, those aren't the numbers that, uh, that I recall. Um, so maybe Secretary Smith can clear that up. Yeah, Tom, we were talking about capacity and in those numbers, and that meant personnel and the capacity to administer the vaccines. Those were, I said, we, we had uh, expected to be able to administer 20,000 uh, uh, doses uh, per week uh, by March 15th, uh, 25,000 doses per week, and by the end of the month, 35,000 doses per week. That is if we had the doses at the time. That is not, uh, there, there's a difference there between the capacity to administer the doses and the, uh, the actual doses. Um, we have coming in, we think, next week, uh, we think we have about, on the state side, about 16,660 doses uh, coming into the state. Now, um, we had hoped that that was gonna be more given the Johnson & Johnson um, but we're going to just have to wait for the next couple of weeks, I guess, on Johnson & Johnson. This week we're administering the state, not the pharmacy programs. The, pharmacy pro the federal pharmacy programs are administering about 5,540 uh, doses next week, about the same that they're doing this week. This week we are using excess doses that we had. I talked about it a little bit earlier through the long-term care facility. Um, to be uh, over 20,000 doses that we're administering this week. So that, that sort of gives you an update. Got it. One, one follow-up on that. Uh, so on those projections of your capacity, have you stayed uh, true to those? Yeah, we're, we, we have. I mean, like I said, this week uh, we have um, over 20, 20K. We, uh, that's, that's with just the state. Add on another um, 5K or so with the, um, w and, you know, the first and second doses and whatever the federal pharmacy program is doing with that. We have the capacity as of uh, the 12th nearing in on 25,000 a week. Okay. Thanks very much. Earlier this week, the state announced an expansion of eligibility for BIPOC Vermonters to bring their household members um, to get vaccinated as well. And in response, I got some emails from BIPOC Vermonters saying, when, where, uh, what, which clinics can I do this for? So I would just like to know, um, you know, if you're just a, a, a BIPOC Vermonter uh, who would like to participate in this program, how can you find out about it and and get registered? Commissioner Levine. Well, thank you, and I'm glad that uh, my comments were noticed about the program. Um, so we've anticipated there would be some questions. I was careful in my comments previously to say that it was not beginning this week. So I hope I didn't set any uh, unrealistic expectations for people that will be in the ensuing weeks. Um, we're currently working on coordinating our uh, vaccine clinic events in partnership with community partners and pinning down the precise locations that these events will occur at. So I would just ask everybody to be patient and check the health department website for additional information when it becomes available. In the meantime, uh, don't worry that your name isn't on a list because there is no wait list. Um, and do not try to walk into a clinic to get a vaccination as a walk-in because uh, that program is not going to be recognized at the clinic right now. It's, those are all by appointments. But clearly, um, individuals who want to take advantage of this program will be able to in these next several weeks. And we're just making sure all the details are pinned down. Some people ask, you know, what, <clears throat> what populations qualify as a BIPOC Vermonter? And the answer to that is 
that if you self-identify as black, indig indigenous, or person of color and live in Vermont, you qualify for the program. Um, other question would be what qualifies as a household member? And clearly, again, if there is somebody who's in the household who's eligible to get the vaccine in the program I just talked about, uh, and there are other people who are household members of that eligible person, they qualify, assuming they're not younger than 16 and wouldn't qualify for a vaccine at this time. Okay. Um, you know, you've mentioned in the past that you're working with community groups to kind of do outreach to communities of color. I was wondering if you were doing any work with community groups to reach high-risk Vermonters as a group. Um, you mentioned on Tuesday that they were potentially kind of under your target for registration um, sign-ups. Um, I had one high-risk Vermonter email me to say that their doctor had reached out to them to tell them, oh, registration is open now. Um, you should, you know, just letting them know you should sign up. Uh, is there anything like that kind of being planned or, or just any kind of targeted outreach? Yeah, the main art outreach we've had is actually over the course of these conferences when we've announced who qualifies in those groups, We've had uh, on our website for quite some time uh, what conditions qualify for those groups. Um, and we've worked with the medical community, if you will, uh, so that they can be informed as their patients ask them questions about, about if they qualify or not qualify. We haven't done a specific outreach to a specific disease condition, you know, like the American Heart Association for Heart Conditions or the Lung Association for COPD. Um, and I don't think there is a need to, actually, because I think everyone in these groups has been waiting uh, with bated breath, hoping that we would get to this band as quickly as possible, because they've been so concerned about their own conditions all along. So that kind of uh, communications I've been receiving are just making sure that the person has the right condition and wondering when their time will come. Um, so I, I, we have not perceived there's a need for further uh, engagement uh, of groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess just the parallel thing I was thinking of is in the England, of course, they have the NHS, which is a really convenient system for reaching out to people who qualify. Is there something like that in Vermont? I mean, I know the UVM Health Network has kind of a coordinated health system. Is that a possible route to take to take? Right, we, you know, you could, I suppose, use large databases of health information uh, to connect with people. Uh, I just really don't think that that's been that important at this point in time. Uh, but I, well, I do want to take advantage of your question, though, to allow me to say that uh, clearly um, there is opportunity for people who are in the high-risk condition group to skill, still schedule appointments and one should not be hesitant about it uh, because we have a process for you and it's pretty easy to do. Uh, so please make your, make your uh, voice heard and uh, register on the site and schedule your appointment. Okay, thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, thanks Rebecca, good afternoon. Uh, now that the folks are getting vaccinated, is there any indication when the U.S.-Canadian border might start to reopen? And I'm also curious that how the state is going to collect information, if they're going to collect information for uh, farm workers so they're not concerned about re um, facing other legal problems? Um, I might ask you to clarify the second question. The first question, um, that I had asked that actually at the uh, the governor's um, conference call with the White House about what the plan was going to be in the future with the Canadian border. A number of us uh, have share borders with Canada and uh, wondering whether there's going to be some sort of a vaccine card or passport or something that might be uh, utilized in the future. They didn't have a whole lot of information at that point. Obviously, this is a negotiation between the Canadian government and the federal government and uh, it doesn't involve the states. 
um, but um, but I think it's it's not too soon to start thinking of that. I I think we're still. Um, I bet I, I'm, I'm confident there'll be an extension, uh, and we won't see the border opening up this month. But I think it's um, it might be the 23rd right now of March. That seems to um, be a recall of a date uh, right at this point in time. But we'll see um, what happens. But it's it's clearly out of our hands. And maybe you could uh, okay, great. clarify the second and question. So far as the second question, no, I'm just wondering if when you collect information from migrant farm workers, um, what information you're co going to collect from them, if any, so they don't face concerns about being deported or anything along those lines. Yeah, we're not uh, we're not anticipating collecting any information from them. Uh, okay, ask, great. Thank maybe you. Maybe I'll just ask Commissioner Levine to elaborate. Yeah, I, I, I say exactly what the governor said about not collecting information, but also they fall into the groups that we actually work with our community partners to engage. So, uh, you know, so some of the migrant farm workers uh, may live in a congregate setting, so they may be at higher risk of transmission of virus to one another and getting ill. Uh, so we certainly want them to get vaccinated, and that's part of the effort we're doing now. Um, beyond the traditional, if you will, BIPOC designation, since these migrant farm workers are from uh, a variety of places in the world, uh, we want to make sure that we are a trusted vaccinating entity to them. And we do that through the partner organizations we have who are advocating for them and working with them to uh, make their lives as healthy and prosperous as possible while they're in our country. So. Uh, we're, we're connected with them and uh, should not be seen as a, a threatening uh, force, if you will, in terms of getting vaccinated. Okay, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Uh, good afternoon. I have a question that uh, was sent to us by a reader who wanted to know whether the uh, current outbreak at uh, Northern State Correctional Facility uh, does or should have an effect on the measures in place at local long-term care facilities uh, to restrict or allow visitation. Well, from our standpoint, Joe, and I'll let others answer this, um, but. Uh, that's why we went and, you know, we did the age banding. Um, we did uh, the long-term care facilities, making sure that we were able to vaccinate that population so they should be uh, protected at this point. So uh, I'm not sure that anything would change uh, based on that information, but Secretary Smith. Joe, thanks for the question. I'm gonna um, expand it a little bit because I think people should know that um, in our correctional facilities, we have a philosophy of test to suppress, uh, which is being done, um, which is not being done throughout Vermont. Um, we, we would like to do that, we, you know, anybody that wants a test. But we have sort of mandatory testing in uh, our correctional facilities. And as a result, we're picking up m sort of more asymptomatic COVID positives than would otherwise not be identified. They wouldn't be identified if we were just doing uh, testing for symptoms. So as we look at the um, positivity rate, and I think that's what we look at as a state, and that's what we would look at as a, um, uh, you know, in comparison with a corrections uh, facility as well. And this is, you know, the number of positive COVID, COVID tests divided by the number of tests conducted. You have to remove some duplicates uh, within a 90, 90 day of each other. But if you look at the positivity rate within our in-state correction facility, it is 1.5%. Now you'll notice that number is basically the same number as the state as a whole uh, at 1.5%. 1, 5, 1. 5 so we really uh, pay attention to that number and really, uh, um, you know, corrections, I, I, I think there are some numbers that really, um, really stick out. I mean, Corrections has done 17,050 uh, tests as of um, uh, two days ago. And the rate of testing that we do is second in the nation, 
Um, you know, we, we both do in-state and uh, out-of-state, uh, you know, in terms of uh, positivity rate. And when you put both in-state and out-of-state, and of course we have out-of-state prisoners, we're the third lowest positivity rate um, in the nation, but we're missing out from being number one by three-tenths of, uh, of a percent. Uh, so we're three-tenths of a percent behind. But looking at it apples to apples, there's very few states that have a unified correctional facility like we do. And if you look at the states that have uh, a correctional facility like we do, um, you know, in the Northeast, for example, Rhode Island and Connecticut, but there's also Delaware and Hawaii and others. If you look at that, um, we are, Vermont DOC has the lowest rate of COVID positives when compared to all other uh, unified correction systems in the nation. And of course, we've had zero deaths and we've had a half a percent hospitalization rate. We've had two out of uh, four, 411 that have been hospitalized. So those are the statistics that we look at when we're looking at um, protecting those inmates. And as I mentioned earlier, we are vaccinating inmates in the same way that we vaccinate any other Vermonters through the age bands, through high risk conditions, and we'll continue to do that as we move forward. I, I, I don't know if I answered your question, did I? Um, well, you answered a lot of questions. Um, the specific question I had was whether the fact that there is at the moment uh, an outbreak in um, in at Northern State should affect how people outside the facility in the community act. In other words. Um, yeah. If you were running a long-term care facility, would you tighten up the rules on visitation as a result? Yeah, we have tightened up the rules on visitation um, in our correctional facilities since, uh, since last March. We also, um, when we have positives within our facility, we do go into full lockdown or semi-lockdown, depending on what we have there. So we try to contain the spread uh, in there. In most cases, what we're seeing <clears throat> is that our facilities have been very, very safe. Where the virus has been coming through is through staff that live in the community. Um, so where the, where the virus is coming in is through staff. So we have various protections that we, we, have, uh, we have done to keep the virus contained within the facility, and we have started in terms of uh, the testing protocol that we do to make sure that it doesn't get into the facility. I think he's worried about the long-term care facilities and, and you're breaching them, and should they be oh. up? Yeah, it, and, and Joe, did you, was your question, if, if this is an outbreak in Newport, should we be worried about the long-term care facilities in that community because of the outbreak at the correctional facility. Is that the crux of your question? I think it was. Okay, I am, then I apologize. The, the most, um, you know, the, we have not seen that in terms of long-term care facilities being impacted. In fact, if you, if you saw Michael Pichek's um, uh, slide the other day, you will see that uh, 70 and uh, up, there's been a tremendous drop off um, with the 70 plus up um, population in terms of COVID related cases and COVID related deaths. Thank you, that was a lot to digest. I appreciate it. Hi, my question is for the governor. Uh, you opened the press conference by saying that you think Vermont can not only meet the May 1st target that the White House set for um, vaccine eligibility, but that the state could exceed it. Um, I'm wondering if there's, I know you're talking about timelines coming uh, soon that we might learn more, but is there anything you can say now about, you know, how much earlier than May 1st 
would uh, Vermont be positioned to have everyone eligible for a vaccine? Yeah. Can you say that at this point? Again, you know, I'm going to uh, confuse the issue a bit, but um, we are waiting to see what the supply is um, with our plan uh, from an age banding perspective and uh, the segments that we want to lay out for you next week. Uh, we still believe if we receive more supply that we'll get through that quicker and we'll be able to uh, to meet or exceed uh, those signing those people up even in the last uh, category. Um, but to be honest, uh, again, you could play the game here and other states have. Um, all you'd have to do uh, is open up the age band. I mean, you could you, you could open up from 16 to to 50 uh, to meet uh, that goal of uh, May 1st. So that doesn't tell you a lot about getting shots in arms and getting people vaccinated. So uh, again, we're confident here in Vermont uh, that we will have uh, the majority of those who want to be vaccinated long before uh, the 4th of July. Um, so that's our goal is to, uh, to work along our plan uh, with age banding in the traditional sense of what we've uh, what we've laid out, and uh, do it before May first. But some of it does depend on the supply. Great, thanks. And then for Dr. Levine or you, Governor, um, is there any concern about any spikes in case counts um, for the the, re the relaxing of restrictions on non-vaccinated households gathering? I know that the guidance still applies for folks to wear masks and, and distance themselves, but um, it didn't sound, I think like the restaurant guidance, um, multiple households could go there and dine together and they presumably won't be wearing masks. So I'm just wondering if, if one of you could speak to any concerns about a spike potentially. Yeah, yeah I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer that, but uh, obviously we're always concerned about case counts, but uh, at the same time, our strategy has been about reducing the number of hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, so by focusing on uh, those uh, greatest risks, as we have done with the chronic conditions and so forth, uh, moving through those populations and the age bands that we have, uh, we feel uh, good about uh, it, it, that we have reduced uh, the number of hospitalizations and deaths. And those, that's what we're focusing on, and that's what we'll watch. Uh, the case counts are, are going to continue uh, to be about what they are, I believe. Uh, we, we'd like to see them reduced, but um, but it's almost a, f a fact of life uh, because we can't eradicate uh, the uh, the virus, as Dr. Levine had said earlier. But I'll let Dr. Levine answer the rest of the question. Thank you, Governor. So, you know, in my uh, prepared comments, you know, I did talk about masking, did talk about um, the fact that this is going to continue for some months. I'm certainly an advocate of people who go to a restaurant wearing their masks while they're not eating and drinking. There's no problem with that. And I'm not so concerned about people getting transmission of virus from one table to another table because we have a lot of good strategies and guidance in place that the restaurants have been very faithful to. Um, but that part of my talk about having the COVID talk uh, is still important because presumably you're not dining with strangers, you're dining with people uh, who you want to go out to uh, have a meal with. Uh, so just actually having an understanding and taking, I hate to say it, but some personal responsibility for the level of risk you're willing to put yourself uh, towards, if you're unvaccinated specifically, because that's what the question was framed around. So clearly, um, you know, you presumably know the uh, other couples or families or individuals that you're dining with and uh, have a sense uh, that this would be uh, as safe an experience as it could be during uh, the times we're in and covered that at least in your own preliminary thinking or even in your discussions with them as you were making plans to meet them. So that's how I would look at that. Thanks, that's all for me. Governor, earlier this week, you said that long-term, more state employees may work from home. Your budget proposes to sell three Baldwin Street Montpelier office buildings, which were built 
as residences. Have you considered rehabbing these buildings and other unneeded state buildings into much needed low and medium income housing? Uh, I don't, you know, it's a good question, uh, but uh, what I know about the buildings that we're talking about, uh, they were single family dwellings. Uh, be tough to turn them into uh, something that would cost a lot of money uh, to renovate in, in, in terms of uh, a multifamily house uh, that would accommodate uh, multifamilies. So um, I don't think that would be the best use of money. I'd much rather um, sell those, uh, put them back on the tax rolls um, so uh, it continues to uh, to lower uh, the tax burden on others. Um, but uh, maybe building more efficient uh, housing in, in different areas. Now, if this was a uh, somebody owned the, the home themselves or bought the, these uh, buildings, they could do whatever they wanted and maybe they would see something that I'm not seeing. Uh, but uh, but the ones I'm I'm thinking about, I'm not sure uh, are conducive uh, to uh, the type of res residential uh, expansion that you're thinking. Okay, thank you. Um, I've heard your administration <clears throat> may replace a member of the Fish and Wildlife Board over some social media posts about national elected officials. Do you plan any imminent changes in the membership of the Fish and Wildlife Board? Um, we have not contemplated that at this point in time, no. Thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, this question is likely for Secretary Smith. Uh, when it comes to inmates and the state moving to another uh, vaccine group or expanding access to the vaccine, are those inmates who are eligible approached or is it on them to figure out they're eligible and to ask for it themselves? Yeah, I believe we know who they are and we know how old they are and we go to them. And that also would like high risk conditions? I believe it's the same there. We know their health situation so we can go to them. And when uh, inmate says they do want the vaccine, how long usually does it take for them to get it? Is it the same amount of time as somebody who's not an inmate? Yeah, I would say it's probably a, a shorter period of time, but uh, I, Secretary Smith is uh, shaking his head yes. It's uh, usually a shorter period of time. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, probably for Secretary Smith, this one. Um, when you're about the persistent and now widening lag in vaccinations in Essex County, um, is this a question of availability of doses and clinics, or is there a lower rate of uptake uh, by the residents there? Um, I'm fairly certain it's not a demographic issue because Essex is the oldest county in the state. So um, why the lag, and, and are you doing anything to address the the issue. That's a great question, Andrew. Thank you for asking it. Um, we've, you know, as you know, we've put more, more and more um, vaccination clinics in there, uh, Beecher Falls, um, Island Pond, and then, you know, so surrounding that county in St. Johnsbury uh, at the southern end of that county and also um, on sort of the uh, western side of that county in Newport, plus the pharmacy programs. We're trying to delve into that a little bit of why the uptake. Um, it's been increasing, as you as you pointed out, maybe about a month ago, it was really low. Um, it has been increasing um, in the last uh, uh, few weeks to um, three weeks, but we we are we're a little puzzled there. And and I, you know, we added the Beecher Falls vac vaccination clinic primarily for that reason, to get the northern section of that county, um, you know, a place to go, plus the mid part of that county in Island, in Island Pond, and then, you know, the, the hospitals on sort of bordering that county. Um, we're going to continue to look at that. I, I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Uh, and then uh, uh, for the governor, uh, I've got a spigot question for you from a business, but it may not be what you expect. Um, this is about the employee retention tax credit, which was just extended through the end of this uh, end of the year by the American Rescue Plan. 
Um, as described to me, this tax credit is significant and one of the easiest qualifying metrics is if their operations are fully or partially suspended due to COVID restrictions. Um, it's described as a windfall uh, that many businesses should take advantage of. And so they're wondering, is it likely some level of restriction will stay in place through the end of the year so that they can count on being eligible for this uh, tax credit and uh, allow that to weigh on some immediate hiring decisions? Yeah, I'm not sure about the uh, rules that will be written around that in particular, um, but I might refer to Secretary Curley to, to see if she has any um, anything to offer on that. Sure, Governor. Actually, this was raised to me this week by another business owner, and I have reached out to the tax department. I just need some help on it because I'm not really sure who has the lever to pull on this one. So um, I don't have an answer yet, but I'm happy to get back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just knowing that it's being considered, I'm sure will be of some comfort to the business owner. Um, and I know we're running late, but if I, if I may uh, just pipe in on an issue that Mike uh, Donahue uh, raised earlier, and I saw Jason just emailed out the school report. Um, I, I've come to realize that that school report, uh, when it comes to the cases within schools, doesn't account for all of the cases that have occurred as a result of school activities. Um, I'll point out that there was an outbreak here at a high school in the kingdom uh, that affected 14 uh, members of the school community, but the report only reflects one case uh, because the other 13 subsequent infections had been um, quarantining and weren't considered uh, infectious well at a school activity. So um, it, it, at least on the surface, it strikes me as being a report that maybe doesn't fully reflect the prevalence of the virus and its impact on schools. Well, again, I think, um, and maybe Dr. Levine or somebody else can answer this, but if they find one positive case and they've interacted with others, they have to quarantine, but it doesn't mean that they're, um, they're infectious or in, have been infected. Is that what you're getting at? That it should show who's been, yeah. who should quarantine? I, that would be a vast list, it, but if we did that throughout the system, because as you know, I mean, I, I was, I had to quarantine at one point along with Dr. Levine, and I'm not sure that we were counted in that, um, in that because we weren't, we, we didn't have the virus. Well, no, I'm not saying that it should reflect the number of people that had to quarantine and, and eventually uh, were proven to be negative. I'm, I'm saying there was an outbreak that, that infected 14 kids or, or community members could have been staff. Um, uh, however, the school report only ticked up by one case because the 13 additional cases um, all developed their symptoms and were infectious while they were at home. So the report suggests that this high school has only had five cases, but it's really approaching 20 at this point. But again, yeah, it was, I mean, but again it was, I'm, I'm just- an outbreak, but the report doesn't show that. Yeah, I'm just wondering, did they, did they get a test to determine they were indeed positive, I guess, or did they just yes. have symptoms? Okay. Dr. Levine. Yes, on, on all counts. Yeah, so this is Dr. Levine. So um, obviously what you're, the crux of the matter of what you're discussing is how much connection was there for the school environment and becoming a case as opposed to people were in a community, uh, got infected, couldn't go to school because they were sick, uh, but there was one student who was present in the school at a time when they may have been infectious. So those are the kinds of uh, decision making that gets made from an epidemiologist standpoint. So I'd appreciate it if you would connect with us about the exact incident in school, because I'm sure we have an explanation for it, and I want to be precise, but I think I've given you the, uh, the gist of how we analyze these. Okay, uh, thank you for the extra time. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yes, uh, this first question is for Dr. Levine. Um, I have a couple of reader questions. First, um, being that 
you know, if someone tests positive for COVID, um, how long should they wait for getting the vaccine? And is that any different if the person happens to have a high one of the high risk conditions? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, it is important that if you've ever had COVID, and no matter when you've had COVID, that you still get the vaccine. But the answer to the first part of your question is that we want you to be well and resolved when you get the vaccine. So normally we would say to wait several weeks before you get the vaccine after you've uh, had your illness and resolved all of your symptoms. And that doesn't change if you have an underlying condition no. or anything like that? And no, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't qualify it with anything. Nope. Okay. Um, my second question would be for um, Governor. So we recently in town here had the uh, YMCA, a YMCA child care center closed, which took away 38 slots for child care. Um, you know, obviously it's a problem around the state and you'd identified it during your state of the state speech, but I just want to know sort of where is the administration at on um, support for these child care centers and child care in general? I'm going to let Secretary Smith answer this one. As you know, we um, provided tremendous financial support during the uh, during the pandemic to child care centers. In fact, uh, we subsidized child, uh, child care centers even to make sure uh, that they stayed in business. So when we came out in June out of the sort of the initial impact, um, that, that they were still there to, pro to provide uh, uh, child care. We also provided subsidies for those essential workers during the first part of the pandemic, and we provided money for them to come out uh, to help uh, adjust in terms of the supplies they needed and other things. Subsequently, in conjunction with the legislature, we've provided even more money. Uh, we're close to $42 million, and there are other areas that are looking to be funded as we move forward. Um, there is a bill that's going through the legislature right now that has uh, child care emphasis on it. The governor has been very, very clear that he wanted to make sure that this pandemic, we came out of it with a strong uh, child care system, and we've done that. Nationwide, we were one of the ones that were recognized for what we did. Many states didn't even invest in their child care systems when uh, the pandemic hit. We, we did not choose to go down that path. We went just the opposite way. We invested heavily into our child care system to make sure that it was stabilized and it was there for us when we needed it, when we started opening um, uh, things back up. So uh, I don't know the particular situation in St. Albans. I'll look into the particular situation in St. Albans. Um, it concerns me uh, when a child care center does, um, uh, does close down. Uh, as you know, we created hubs uh, as well uh, for child care during the time we were opening up uh, schools in the in September a lot of investment into child care let me do this let me have uh, my office reach out to you to find out uh, the particulars of this and we can uh, we can go from there yeah thank you I, I don't misconstrue that um, uh, you know I was by no means criticizing the child care response I was just it's a, it's a lot of concerned folks about that uh, facility closing down, down around here so I figured I'd flag it for you guys. Okay. No, we will look into it. How's that? Great. Thank you. That's all I have. Tommy, still reporter. Oh, can you hear me now? We can. Uh, Dr. Levine, um, the, the health department last week identified Stowe as uh, one of a couple of places where uh, the COVID spread was significant, uh, significant enough to warrant a two-day testing clinic at the high school this past weekend. Uh, considering the town's aggressive adherence to pandemic regulations and what we're seeing seems to be a, a fairly high level of buy-in from the local population, the mystery is where the, the spread's coming from. 
has uh, the testing clinic over the weekend and or contact tracing and still giving any insight as to the cause of the spread, whether it's in-state or out-of-state folks, ski resort guests, bar, restaurant, um, uh, diners? Yeah, fortunately, um, there were not abundant positive tests um, out of the uh, weekend clinic, and there were actually less than 200 tests done. Um, but that may, I'm not criticizing the number because, again, we're coming in a smaller area. But the bottom line is um, perhaps we're at the peak and are coming down because when we look at our county data across all of Vermont, uh, Lamoille County has kind of um, leveled off and not gone up, and it's not that far off from the average county in Vermont at this point. It was much more Stowe, uh, stood out more as a community that had a higher than expected caseload. So um, at this point in time, there's nothing about new cases that has guided us in any way that's going to be helpful. My hope is that we're seeing a decay in the rate of new cases occurring so that uh, things will sort of take care of themselves, if you will, and Stowe and the rest of the county will just continue to assume the appearance of the rest of the state when it comes to case growth. Wish I could, give you, wish I could give you more than that, but uh, nothing has I mean, turned out. Sorry, was the hypothesis that Stowe was an outlier because of just because of being a, the, the, a big tourism town related, I mean, in comparison to the rest of the county? Yeah, that's, that's always a potential hypothesis and certainly was one of them. Um, and that has ne neither been proven or disproven at this time. And the only data we have is the Bromley and Mount Stratton data that didn't really implicate out-of-state disease vectoring as being a super prominent role. Uh, in the cases that they were seeing. Uh, but I can't necessarily apply that directly to Stowe. Thank you. And um, if I may, again, Governor, um, uh, acknowledging what you said earlier about the large list of workers who feel like they ought to be prioritized for vaccinations and how you hope everyone can be signed up by May, I would be remiss if I didn't pass along the concerns of of restaurant workers here in Stowe, of which we have a lot and of, of which um, I'm getting a lot of, of, of concerns from. Uh, several Stowe restaurants have had to close down temporarily uh, due to COVID exposure. And a lot of people are saying that's just the right thing to do. And they're not, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not in, they're not permanent closures. They're, they're weekend closures. But, but what, what I hear from a lot of, um, restaurant workers you know these are restaurant workers largely from the house who work for tips rely mostly on tips working among mostly maskless diners so what kind of message uh you know would you deliver to the restaurant workers who have to go in every day to work for tips and the people they're you know serving don't wear masks yeah well again i have a extreme amount of sympathy uh for them respect for them and what they've had to endure, what all Vermonters have had to endure over the last year. Uh, we were able to get through uh, the first part of that, uh, you know, 11 months, 10, 11 months without a vaccine. And we're just going to have to be as cautious as possible and get through the next six to eight weeks. So um, that's all I can offer. Um, every single sector uh, can make an argument as to why they should be put to the front of the line. And if we did that for every single sector, uh, we wouldn't get through uh, this as quick as I believe we'll get through it as if we do it with a clear, concise plan of age banding. So, um, you know, sympathetic, um, but at the same time, I just think this is the right path forward and just be as careful as possible and, um, and we'll get through it. We'll get, we'll get through it. Thank you. That's it. I, I won't hold up the, uh, the end of the caboose any longer. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. That's it. Okay, well, thank you very much, and we'll see you again on Tuesday.